आई एम स्टूडेंट ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स टू ऑपरेशनल स्ट्रैटेजी टू कंट्रोल द वर्ल्ड वाई मतलब कोई चीज किताब में लिखी है और कोई चीज उनकी किताब में लिखी है जो सबसे बड़ा स्कॉलर है मैनिपुलेट द नॉलेज मीन वॉट इज मोर इंपॉर्टेंट इज इकोनॉमिक पावर वॉट इज अ पोलिटिकल आइडिया दिस इज एन आइडिया विच वी क्रिएट एंड हाउ डू वी क्रिएट दैट आइडिया a small dose of truth but a strong dose of say falsehood delegitimizing truth appeal to your baser instincts here play the politics of othering dheere dheere unhone kya kiya ki fact ko drive out karna hai you are just promising the stars gareeb logon ko bhi dawa mil jaye i now welcome professor rasul bek to the stage thank you learned <laughs> faculty members and dear students I am a student of politics and I have very little to do with literature although I studied English in my BA class a relationship of this idea with with politics in general of course you know it will make sense to you because politics is all pervasive so it affects uh, everything you know around us in the 20th century especially after 1945 that is the period after the uh, second world war what basically happened in the world of global politics was that the western world led by america had to devise a new operational strategy to control the world why because since the advent of human civilization the only means known to man for controlling other men was force coercion if i am more powerful than you then i'll control you as a as a country or a nation state maybe in the modern times but slowly and gradually this kind of control this kind of domination which was fashionable all through in politics had got slowly and gradually you know had gone out of fashion and after the second world war you know because we were very tired after two world wars you know one after the other and the world realized that it's a bit too much you know the use of force and any ideology associated with that use of force also slowly got delegitimized for example to cut a long story short uh, in the 19th century it was very fashionable for countries to boast of their colonies you know and you had a lot of respect in the global political arena because you were a big colonial power so britishers were the biggest colonial power and they were very proud of it and they are still proud of their past and similarly other european countries were similarly you know very proud and they were given so much of importance because they are big colonial powers so colonialism and imperialism which were very fashionable in the 19th century by the end of the second world war they got out of fashion so people started saying that how can you colonize people you know how can human beings go and control other human beings you know it's not right you know we are free countries and uh, and any nation state does not have the right to dominate over other countries you know we are all sovereign independent free countries of the world so this century saw the consolidation of this idea of sovereign independent nation states and how so powerful you are you could not just go across the border and dominate and control the other country and change the geographical boundaries of your country and that you saw all through the 20th century but although colonialism and imperialism got delegitimized the urge for countries and powers to dominate and the need to dominate also continued that was still there we had to control other people to remain powerful to remain rich to remain dominant but what to do now so they devised a new operational strategy and that strategy was to now control you by the use of consent means we will control you still but we will not do it straight forward you know by going and dominating over you and coercion and power and force which is so very apparent we will do it but we will obtain your consent for that we will do it in a different way but as we all understand that obtaining consent for your own domination and exploitation is not so easy it's a difficult task how to bring you around this point when you agree to your own exploitation so therefore they 
thought of a few operational strategies or rather instruments which could be used in this game of control and domination. One of them was knowledge. I'm talking of this because we are all in this business of knowledge dissemination or sometimes even creation. So, because the idea was that whatever comes, whatever idea comes to the minds of human beings, that comes through, through books, through the media, through other instruments, you know, with which we interact. So, it was a very ambitious idea that suppose we can control anything and everything which goes to your mind, we will eventually be able to control what you think, what ideas come out of your mind. So we are trying to control, we are gatekeepers here, controlling anything which enters the minds of people anywhere in the world. And they could think of it because they, they realized that all the big centers of knowledge creation, you know, the big universities, the big laboratories, the big think tanks, all the other such institutions, we still are, and they were at that time also, and even today they are in the West. So they had those institutions, all the media houses, whatever was uh, their stage of development at that time, they were also there in the West. So they thought that this is something which we can, we can possibly do. Because if we can control the ideas and the thoughts of people, we could eventually be able to bring them around to our point of view. And then it would be easy for us to control them, to dominate over them and to obtain their consent for domination. So it is this you know, this situation actually in global politics from where the idea of post-truth had started germinating, although we had not yet reached to this point. And of course, you know, when you have to create that kind of a consent, you have to manipulate things. You know. Because as students, you know, as these students, and we were also students not long ago, so we all know that, we all understand that whatever there, whatever is there in in books, you know, which we read, is something which is true, you know, it's truth in the books. You also quote the books in the classes, teachers, we quote them, and in our conversations also. I'll say that this is written in that book, you know. So that is the strongest argument which I can give for my, you know, from my side, you know, that this is there in a book. So something which is there in a book is very authentic. And something which is there in a book written by X, who is supposed to be a top person in that field is 100% authentic. Are you getting my point? But the Koichi's kitab mein likhi or Koichi's unki kitab mein likhi, jo sabse bada scholar hai. So the experts are all, all ours. These experts, whom you all would eventually know or already know, they are the top scholars in all these fields of literature, of science, of social sciences, whatever they are own, our own people. They are all in the West. And now we are telling them, that till now you were only producing knowledge. You continue to produce knowledge fine, but now that knowledge has to align with our strategic, political and economic interests. So it has to be consistent with that. Till now, maybe you were producing only knowledge, you know, knowledge for knowledge sake. But now knowledge is for knowledge sake fine, but our interest has to be interwoven in that knowledge. Now, here, is the point when knowledge starts getting political. Now what happens, you are trying to manipulate the knowledge, means these people are being made to manipulate that knowledge which they create to make it consistent with our interests. So that in other words means that you are introducing some element of falsehood to give a spin to that knowledge in whatever field it is, you know, and, and whatever field you are in, you will understand. I will give you a few examples also to illustrate it that how it is done. So we are introducing some element of lie and, and that spin is being justified in the name of a larger interest. And the larger interest is the national interest of my country, maybe assuming that I am America, it's, it's our country's interest, you know, that's why you have to do this. And that larger interest is said is was given the name of the rationality of the state. So it is not plain interest, it is also rational. 
If I were to say that it is my interest, you would say that it's something not so good here. But when I say that it is rational also, it is the ultimate rationality. Means the interest of my country and rationality becomes synonymous you know, here in this context. And I as the leader of my country or maybe the strategic community in my country, we are defining the interest. So we are defining what is rational. Otherwise, it is not truly rational, of course, but that is how we are justifying that truth with some element of falsehood, you know. And that is how, you know, we start creating knowledge. And, of course, you know, since we are the dominant knowledge creators in the world, because of those uh, institutional advantages we have, so... Any discourse in any discipline, any field is something which starts from us. We start the discourse. And we not only start the discourse, we are on both sides of the discourse also. If someone is going to talk about a discussion, then the one who is here and the two who are here are getting my point. Both are, the defendant is also my own person you know, and the prosecution is also mine. So, we give it a semblance of, of a discourse, of a discussion. Actually, there is none. And people in the world, discerning people like you and me, who, who think that we understand things, we are caught up here or there, you know. But wherever you go, you know, you are within that circle. So we are defining the limits of your movement, you know, your so-called intellectual movement, you know, within that discipline. We are controlling everything. And that's, that's how, you know, we ensure that whatever knowledge is created in different fields also, obviously with certain exceptions, <laughs> where our, wherever our interests lie, we ensure that this kind of a knowledge is created. And then what happens, this period after 1945 is also a period whereby it was resolved in the West again that now to control the world, you do not necessarily only need military power. What is more important is economic power. So the most important thing is control or economy, economic risk. Actually, earlier also, you know, when capitalism started and then consequently you had imperialism, it was all about money. But since to operationalize imperialism, you needed that power. And it was all coercive. So now it was imperialism without that coercion. It was with consent. So you need the economic resources of the world. And since America was the leader of the Western world now post-1945, and America is a country, of course, you all know, run by capitalists, uh, corporates. And these corporates actually, after 1945, slowly and gradually, have come to, come to control the whole American system. So you see how the economic interests of the corporates gets intertwined with the national interest of America. So eventually, whatever is America's interest is the interest of these corporates who have to earn money, who have to control the markets of the world. And for doing that, you need to do a lot of manipulation in terms of, in terms of marketing your ideas, whatever ideas you have, and branding your ideas, and, and it's the whole but it's a whole management thing, you know, that you, how you create that idea, how, do, how you package that idea, how you brand that idea, and then how you market that idea. So all these ideas, or this whole process has that element of your economic interest at the bottom, you know, it, it's always there. And because of that, and, and by the way, what is this whole marketing business? You know? Marketing means that you are trying to exaggerate the, the value of that product and glamorize it to whatever extent possible. Now, these are very nice words, but eventually you are again introducing an element of falsehood or maybe a blatant lie to sell your product because you have to make it so attractive to the clientele. So when it is a product limited to a smaller market, you know, the clientele is this, but 
there could be a product which is for the whole world. The whole world is the market. So it has to be so attractive to, to that clientele, you know, to the global clientele. And it has to be so very attractive. And that is where, you know, capitalism got repackaged as globalization. This is just an example to make you understand. Now, all of you, the moment the word colonialism or imperialism is mentioned, you will not like it. You know. it's, it's something bad. We all experienced colonialism and imperialism in India and elsewhere in the third world. But when the word globalization appears, it is so very attractive. <laughs> globalization is everywhere. And the way it has been marketed, we all have come to understand or we, have, we all have been made to understand that in this world, if you have to survive as a nation state, there is no option but to accept globalization. Now what, what they have done, you know, slowly and gradually that idea of globalization, which like any other idea could have been contested, maybe in the third world, maybe at the people who are the receive, at the receiving end of this idea. But what happened that slowly and gradually, this idea was elevated to the level of common sense. Now, this is very important for students to understand. The moment an idea becomes common sense, it goes beyond debate. Why should I do this? Why should I buy this? Why this car? Why that car? Why this class? Why that paper? Anything. But common sense? I have a teacher class, I have a table, I have a sir, I have a common sense. Common sense means that the whole world is established that the teacher should sit on the chair. ये ऊपर से आसमान से नहीं लिखा है लेकिन हमने ये समझ लिया है कि यही होना है तो जो उसके खिलाफ करेगा वो कॉमन सेंस नहीं तो जो हम आम तौर से सी बात है ना कॉमन सेंस मतलब ऐसा करना चाहिए किसी का सामान बगैर पूछे नहीं लेना मैडम का कॉमन सेंस यू डोंट हैव कॉमन सेंस यू नो यू हैव टू आस्क परमिशन दैट इज फाइन यू नो दीज आर हार्मलेस आइडियाज बट द मोमेंट अ पॉलिटिकल आइडिया बिकम्स कॉमन सेंस इट इज वेरी डेंजरस नाउ अगेन व्हाट इज अ पॉलिटिकल आइडिया a political idea is an idea which benefits some people at the cost of others. So the moment you get that kind of an idea, it becomes political. So now if that idea is in my hands and it is benefiting us here and I am able to elevate that idea to the level of common sense, then these people have no choice but to accept it because it is common sense and everybody has to accept it. Are you getting my po point? I give a simple example. Deta बहुत ही ऑर्डनरी चीजें भी कॉमन सेंस हो जाती हैं जैसे व्हेन ब्रिटिशर्स वर रूलिंग ओवर इंडिया गांधी जी केम अप विद सत्याग्रह एंड ट्रुथ नॉन वायलेंस आप कहेंगे इसमें क्या खराबी है भाई इसमें तो कोई सच इनोसेंट आइडियाज बट व्हेन गांधी जी एम्प्लॉयज दीज इनोसेंट आइडियाज इन द फ्रीडम मूवमेंट दीज आइडियाज आर इन फेवर ऑफ इंडियंस एंड अगेंस्ट द ब्रिटिशर्स इट बिकम्स पोलिटिकल एंड इवेंचुअली यू नो द कॉन्सिक्वेंस सो सच एन इनोसेंट आइडिया ऑल्सो कैन बिकम पोलिटिकल but globalization is not such an innocent idea because we have crafted it with, after a lot of care and deliberation. So therefore, what is this, you know? We create this idea and then we glamorize it, popularize it, make it so very attractive that the whole world is convinced that it is something which is so nice. It is a panacea of all the ills of the world. You know? Everything will be put right, you know, by globalization. I am telling you this. I am the US. I am telling you this. You are all small countries and small people. And I am telling you this. But the advertising, the packaging, the marketing is so very attractive and captivating that you are all taken in here. And eventually what happens is that the whole world accepts globalization as global common sense. Now there is no debate. When the idea becomes global common sense, then you, you can't even dare to question it. Because the moment you question a common sense, people will say, you go out of here. You can sit on this debate, where you sit and where you sit and where you sit. It's a good thing to say in a class. If you go out of here, people will say, you go out of here. It is beyond debate, you know, you don't need to say in a debate. You don't need to say in a globalization. You think about how dangerous it is. My idea reaches to that point. And now what is that globalization? Now what is that globalization? It is that idea, you know, which is intended at controlling you all. But I'm not going into that, what it is, you know, you all know that. Or later some of you may Google it, but uh, you'll know what it means. But the point basically is that this is an idea which we create. And how do we create that idea? A small dose of truth, but a strong dose of, say, falsehood, 
and blacked lies also. So this is what we have been doing, you know, or the we have been seeing in the world, you know, and these are the the elementary, you know, stages from where you know this idea of post truth comes in. The problem is that all these lies are very selective lies and they are intended at subverting a few truths. Are you getting my point? Well, we are very careful that we will speak the truth, but when need be, we will subvert certain truths and contest them and bring, replace them with lies, maybe. What post-truth would do later on is that it will delegitimize truth altogether. That you that people are, who are telling lies there, they are very careful. You know. They want to dress up their lies as truths. That means that they are accepting that truth has value. Truth is important. But because of our certain interests, you know, we, are, we have to tell a lie. So we are rather camouflaging it in some manner, maybe sugarcoating it, and then coming up with lies. Now comes this period, we are confronted with this new term, post-truth. Now this is a period where we are into delegitimizing truth. You know. We are saying that truth is passe, you know, it's gone. What is important is my interest. Now this changeover has a, a strong relationship, although there are other things also in this, but it has a very strong relationship with the 2008 economic crisis in America. I am just touching upon the political side because there are a lot of uh, uh, Nietzsche wrote a lot about that and we could have discussed that but literature people Asim Saab and others will discuss that. Hannah Arendt has also something to say about lies and truth but I am not going into that. I am talking about the political thing. Uh, what happened you know that that economic slump in America. Now America is the richest country in the world. It, is, it was then in 2008 it still is. Now what happened in, in that situation that the economic crisis in America, of course, any such economic crisis always affects more the people who are at the lower levels, the middle classes and the poorest and the, at the lowest level. So that economic crisis in America was not anticipated by the American politicians also and the American planners, economic planners, because they had not thought that America would reach to that point. Now that economic crisis also was precipitated by a string of lies where the whole stock market and the housing sector and the banking sector sold a lot of very attractive lies to the people. And those lies led to a situation whereby a lot of rather missteps came from the government and eventually you know the economy collapsed to a great extent anyway. Now that was a situation where the American political establishment thought, or saw rather, not thought, they saw that in this situation, we would not be able to provide for all the people the basic necessities of life, because that is what is an issue in any election, you know, in any country. When you come for an election, different political parties make a lot of promises. And in a democratic country, you know, it is expected that you will promise certain material benefits to people. Now when material benefits are relatively scarce and some politicians who are clever enough, they sense that even if we promise material benefits to people and we win at this election, eventually we will not be able to provide these resources to them because the country does not have those resources. So it is a very difficult situation that one, you promise certain things <clears throat> and then you are not able to provide them. So that would be very suicidal for your, for your politics, you know, because you have to stay in politics. It's not only a one-time affair, you know, you have to contest election after election. Now in this situation of economic crisis and shortage of resources, what happens that a clever politician would sense that this is an ideal situation where I can resort to identity politics. I can resort to emotive politics. This emotive politics is a new kind of, is a different kind of politics where you don't promise any material benefits to people. 
I as a politician am selling you material benefits. I'll give you electricity, food, roads, hospitals, all these things. The other person here is promising you, he's playing with your emotions. Appeal to your baser instincts here. Play the politics of othering. That he's trying to create a situation whereby he's trying to appeal to a certain section which is the majority that your problems are problems which do not need a material solution but they need an emotional solution and that emotional solution is with me and therefore this person here resorts to emotive politics and emotive politics is a politics which basically is not talking about anything concrete it is it is talking about जिसको कहते हैं एम्प्टी सिग्निफायर्स एक पॉलिटिकल साइंटिस्ट हैं अर्नेस्टो लैकलाउ उन्होंने ये कॉन्सेप्ट दिया है एम्प्टी सिग्निफायर्स उसको वो ऐसा कॉन्सेप्ट है समझ लीजिए जैसे कि एक बलून होता है ना तो व्हेन यू ब्लो एयर इन द बलून इट बिकम्स सो बिग एंड इट्स वेरी कलरफुल इट बिकम्स वेरी अट्रैक्टिव तो छोटा बच्चा होता है उसको आप बलून दिखाते हैं तो बच्चा बड़ा खुश होता है क्योंकि उसको लगता है कि बहुत बड़ी सी चीज़ है मतलब इतना बड़ा कोई टॉय आ गया लेकिन हमको और आपको बताया कि उसमें कुछ नहीं है मतलब बलून इतना ही बड़ा है you prick it and all the air goes out so but from a distance for the child it looks very attractive so these politicians create empty signifiers for the people and for the people it is very attractive but for them they are signifiers full of a lot of potential and they are very attractive and they are much more attractive than what i can talk about if i am talking about real issues you know in your country you know maybe unemployment or whatever so therefore what happens that this was a situation which gave birth to trump a politician in america who started talking about these emotive issues in a country where people thought that nobody can win an election by talking about something other than real issues now in politics these issues are called as real issues housing food medicines whatever electricity other things these are called pseudo issues artificial issues now when you are talking about these issues you have to as i mentioned play with emotions and when you are playing with emotions you have just to be a good demagogue because you are not talking about anything concrete when you are not talking about any anything, anything concrete what trump did was that he started delegitimizing the issues and the people who were talking about real issues so he was not only attacking these issues he was also attacking the people who were talking about real issues and he is talking about things you know which are totally false which are totally made up but they are appealing to your emotions in some way or the other for example i'll give you one example trump said that we have to make america great again now ye pura sentence hi jhoot hai because america actually was the greatest country in the world even at that point of time but he is saying we have to make it great again how to make it great again by driving these people out of america because these are not only mexicans hispanics mexicans uh, you know and all kinds of people they have to be driven out of the country and their jobs will come to you now these people are highly educated people coming from india china and they are at top positions doctors engineers to dheere dheere unhone kya kiya ki fact ko drive out karna hai now when fact is fighting with falsehood in the political arena you have seen in your own country as well fact can never win over lies you know because fact is always qualified with a lot of imperfections but lies are perfect you know but <laughs> i'll create a perfect world you know so how can you fight me you have no chance so and this is very easy also so this was a kind of politics which became very attractive for people elsewhere also because here you don't need to do anything you know you are just promising the stars and stars are studded in the sky they don't come on the ground so that's the best thing you know you have to be just a very powerful speaker that's all and that the same strategy was out, adopted by other leaders bolsonaro in uh, brazil and erdogan in turkey and netanyahu in israel and uh, mr modi in india and and so many other politics it's so very attractive so now you know what happens that a new kind of politics comes in which is so very easy so very effective and where the political party or the leader does not need to do anything so how can this kind of a politics or how how can the old style of politics compete with this kind of a politics and therefore this kind of a politics is gaining a lot of ground and today you find in almost all european countries 
where you could not have even thought of that these kinds of forces would gain some political ground, they are significantly strong in many European countries. Because people have a lot of insecurities. Economies go up and down. And the moment economic insecurity is there in any society, this is the best medicine. I start playing with your emotions. That you have problems, you don't have jobs, you have other issues. And those issues can only be resolved by teaching these people a lesson. So it is doubly advantageous to me. One, I don't promise to do anything because I don't need to do anything. What is to be done? It is to be done by you people. Because these are the internal enemies and you have to teach them a lesson or you have to at least snatch your share from them. So you have to deal with the other section of the population and I am just here as a manager. I am just ensuring that this whole process is done peacefully. So I am not promising anything but I am telling you what you need to do. And what I am telling you is very attractive because you actually also does not, do not need to do any effort to gain those economic rewards. I am not asking you to work hard, I am not asking you to uh, study hard, I am not asking you to do any other thing, I am just asking you to teach these people a lesson, which is very easy. You know. So it is something very attractive, you know, which I am giving you. And that of course eventually leads to a lot of discord in the society and whatever happens, that is a different matter. But this kind of a politics is so very attractive. So what post-truth actually has done, has unleashed a very dangerous kind of politics in the world which is so very attractive to political leaders anywhere in the world. And it's not only democratic leaders who have adopted this, even dictatorial systems are seeing such kind of ideas, you know, in their societies where these leaders are selling all kinds of lies to people. And because they have the media in their hands, all the other instruments of propagating ideas are there with them. So they are able to dress up these ideas very attractively. And of course, you know, people are taken in, you know, most of the times. So that is basically, you know, the, the background to this. I thought I'll talk to you about this background so that uh, you get a, some idea about the political origins of post-truth. So I'll stop here to take your questions because that is more important. देखिए मैं सिंपल बता रहा हूँ अमेरिका इज कैपिटलिस्ट डेमोक्रेसी अमेरिकन सिस्टम इज द पॉलिटिकल मतलब इफ यू लुक एट अमेरिका एंड यू लुक एट इट फ्रॉम द पॉलिटिकल लेंस इट इज पॉलिटिकल कैपिटलिज्म जिसका नाम दे हैव गॉट वेरी नाइस वर्ड्स यू नो न्यू लिबरलिज्म एंड ऑल काइंड्स ऑफ थिंग्स बट इट इज एक्चुअली द पोलिटिकल साइड ऑफ कैपिटलिज्म एंड वॉट इट हैज डन यू नो वेरी it's a very dangerous thing you know what they have done is that they have legitimized capitalism in america and that has been institutionalized so living in america even if you are not satisfied with any of the things which are happening you can't do anything because everything is part of the system that is again you know one aspect of their agenda to create institutions to institutionalize our ideas to create those institutions and then control the institutions so globally also, you know, all institutions, whatever institutions you can name, they are all controlled by America and its allies. So whatever happens in the world happens legally, legitimately, procedurally, but everything is happening according to what I want. You know. It's not a true democracy as somebody would read in the books. You know. So you have a choice, but you have a choice from among the options which I present before you. In America, we have a lot of apples and oranges. It is not apples and oranges. It is two apples. And both apples are mine. So, you have to choose between them. There is no difference between them. They are both the same. You feel like it. So, whether you vote for Democrats or Republicans, both are the same. And you saw it now, you know, in the recent crisis in America. How the Republicans and Democrats have been behaving on issues. But we understand that the American president on paper is supposed to be the most powerful person on earth. He actually is not. Because he has no choice. You have to do exactly what the system tells you to do. So, paper pe powers hain aapke, lekin koi powers nahi. Kyunki system aisa bana hua. Or system unhi loog ko vahaan pochne dega, jo unke liye favorable hai. And if you want to change the system, the system goes against you. I'll give you another example. Obama was an African-American. So, people had a lot of expectations. People who did not know how America runs. 
But anyway, he also tried it to do certain things. One thing which he tried to do, because he came from a certain background, that I will make medical facility accept, accessible to the poor people. Very noble idea. In India, at least, you can go in a hospital, however bad it is, the Malkhan Singh, they'll give you some medicines. You live or die, but at least something happens there. But in America, everything is private. You can't even enter a hospital there. So he thought that I'll give at least this, you know, Obamacare. A very minuscule amount of the national resources was going to be spent in that. But what happened? The whole system went against him. There, all kinds of lies were spread in America about Obama. You know. Some people even called that he should be killed, you know, he should be assassinated because he's he is not a Christian, you know, he is a Muslim, he is a terrorist, he is aligned to the Al-Qaeda, all kinds of things. A uh, all kinds of things were done. And the moment uh, Trump came to power, the first thing he did in office was to repeal Obamacare. And the whole system says it's fine. So something if you look democracy true ho, something which is so much in the interest of the common people is repealed and nobody can raise a voice because the system is such where your voice is not heard. Thank you so much.